Hi, I'm Meg West, host of Garden Wise, Santa Barbara's most informative show about sustainable landscaping. In this episode, we're going to learn all about native plants and pollinators and the many benefits of welcoming them into your garden. We'll visit some iconic gardens in the Santa Barbara area and learn how they use native plants for a well-balanced ecosystem. So here we are at Lotusland, one of the premier gardens on the entire West Coast. I mean, this place is something to behold. And to show us around today is the lead gardener, Corey Wells. Hey, Corey. Hi, Meg. Welcome to Lotusland. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit about the history of this place and how it became such a beacon of beautifulness? Well, the creative force around this place is really the, the famous Madame Gonawalska. She's a diva opera singer from the 20s. She purchased this property in 1941 and put all their efforts into creating this paradise. Well, it's amazing that it's still here today for us to enjoy. So let's take a look. The challenge is growing all these ornamental plants here at, at, in California that are from every corner of the earth. How do you do that in a way that's sustainable, in a way that doesn't use toxic materials to the environment, in a way that's gonna make them last? And that's, that's the secret. And that's the story of Lotus Lands, our transformation from doing it conventionally where we did have a lot of problems and used materials that I don't feel were very appropriate to an organic approach. How many years has that taken you? 20 years about. <laughs> so you've been here through that whole transition. I, exactly. What was the decision process to go totally organic? How did that work? Uh, it, it was driven by necessity. We had rare plants and they're dying. So whatever we're doing wasn't working. Right. So in a way you had nothing to lose. And now we realize that there's beneficial insects that are constantly working on these pest insects. And if you maybe augment the plantings that encourage the beneficial insects, you can reach an equal equilibrium or a balanced ecology. And that's what we're experiencing now. It's working in every garden all the way around Lotus Land. Next, Corey took us to an area of the garden where instead of spraying pesticides, beneficial insects naturally take care of their pest problem. So if I'm in my backyard and I see an interesting insect that I haven't seen before, how do I identify it? How do I know what it is? Yeah, you might be concerned it's a pest even too. Well, the first thing is, is not to worry that it's a pest because if you go try to control it right away and it's not a pest, you might be causing a big imbalance in your insect ecology in your yard. So there are many uh, online websites, the Agricultural Commissioner's Office, Botanic Gardens that can help you identify insects. That's not even really that hard. The point is most of them are not a problem, so don't be concerned right off the bat. Um, there are a few pests that we do learn about, and then we, there are natural ways of controlling them. But in general, it's, we need to unwind the idea that there are pests out there everywhere and they're causing terrible problems for everyone. Once we stop thinking in those terms and just relax and let the plants grow, you'll see balance come to your garden and you'll spend more time watering, planting, and enjoying the design of your garden instead of running around chasing uh, insects to kill them. So here's a great example of something we want to really encourage people to do is if they were to see in their garden all these little white insects, the first reaction might be, oh, there's an insect, I need to spray it. Mm -hmm. But we want to get away from that reaction. Most of the time, you'll see that the plant is suffering from the insect because it's getting too much or too little water, not enough light or, or, too, uh, or too much light. So it's 99% of the time, it's going to be a horticultural problem. You can move the plant, open up the light to it, change the circumstances. That's what we're experts at here. We build gardens that are perfectly suited for the plant's cultural requirements. Great. So next time you have a pest problem in your yard, instead of just going to the store and buying something to spray it with, use your powers of observation and look a little deeper into what's going on with the plant. See if you can solve it in a sustainable way. Next, we headed to the Rose Garden to discover what natural symbiotic relationships are taking place. See this little thrip down in there? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's the pest. See them crawling away? Mm -hmm. But why aren't the plants deformed? How come we're not having problems? It's not just because of the beneficial insects. It's also the fact that we grow these plants with all the micronutrients they're gonna need with good soil biology. And so mm -hmm. the growth is strong. Mm -hmm. Look at the quality of the leaf. It's beautiful. It's waxy, thick, and tough. So you have um, good nutrients in the soil, good compost, mm -hmm. compost tea. Compost tea on the foliage to help reduce disease. And, and all those things. insects working continually 24 right. seven. All layers and layers of, of ecological services being provided to us basically, instead of 
uh, water soluble miracle Grow products that are pushing the plant too hard too quick right actually killing the biology in the soil and then increasing disease and pests on the foliage and on the buds i call that stuff plant crack it is <laughs> and if you stop remember it, it leaches into the groundwater very quickly and then you have no fertilizer available to the plant so you right. have to keep hitting it on the package it says every two weeks we f we fertilize the soil here with alfalfa meal kelp and fish mm -hmm. once a year so economically, it makes sense to be sustainable. It actually saves money, saves time, saves water. Nice, okay. Well, so those of you at home, if you've got some roses that are struggling, avoid the pesticides, avoid the miracle Grow, please. <laughs> Take some of these suggestions that Corey shared with us today, make your rose garden more organic, and look at this. I mean, it's just absolutely stunning. After the rose garden, we made our way to the succulent garden to learn how they got to the bottom of their snail problem and solved it organically. The leaves on these succulents look perfect. Um, do the snails come in here at night and they're just balanced out? There aren't so many of them that the plants can deal with the snails here? Or, or what's the balance yeah. that you found with snails? Well, I wanted to find out what was the real issue. Why were we having so many snail problems and why was everyone in town having snail problems? And it turns out the watering actually was one of the big issues in a lot of gardens. If you have an automatic system that comes on three times a week, you maintain moisture in the ideal range for snails and it's actually too much for your plants or they might tolerate it, but it's great for snails. The, one of the main principles in sustainable uh, landscape technique ideas is deep and infrequent watering. And you'd be surprised how many plants love that. Everything from camellias to uh, succulents love it deep and it, it cleans the soil profile it allows the surface to dry just a little bit which is not ideal for snails next we headed to the japanese garden to see how a garden that doesn't feature native plants can actually be maintained with the help of beneficial insects so when i look around here i don't see a whole lot of plants that are attracting beneficial insects right you're actually right there are almost no plants in here that make good beneficial insect habitat and that is a challenge so how do you deal with that well, it's always been a problem. So what we did is we had to get clever. We actually took beneficial insect attracting plants and cleverly hid them behind the, the plants here. So out at the perimeter, we have our habitat. Beneficial insects can kind of pour over the, the tops of the shrubs into the garden and take care of any pests that are in here. So thanks so much for having us today, Corey. It's You're been welcome. really fun. I'm curious. If you had to sum up your philosophy on sustainable landscape maintenance in a few words, what would it be? Well, basically we're creating a, an ecologically based garden. Uh, it's a sustainable garden and it functions on a variety of ecological services all meshed together. So you've got from the soil to the insects, to the plants, to the birds, all of the parts working together interconnected to, to strengthen the entire system. Exactly, and, and it, it keeps functioning too, which is wonderful. We don't right. have to reinvent it each time. It continues into the future. Okay, so that's something you can do in your own backyard. Steer away from the chemical pesticides and fertilizers, build that ecological system and those interconnected parts, and your garden will thrive. Our next stop took us to the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden to talk with Denise Knapp, who is participating in a study about native plants and their relationship with native pollinators. The Botanic Garden is here to conserve native plants, so we do that through education, we do that through our conservation programs where we work to, to uh, protect rare plants, and we do it through research as well. Uh, and this is an example where we're starting up programs to, uh, to look at the benefits of native plants in an agricultural setting. There's some great research that's come out of UC Berkeley. Um, Gordon Frankie has, has had it up and it shows that native plants are four to six times more likely to attract a lot of native pollinators. And that makes a lot of sense given that they've evolved together. Native pollinators come in all shapes and sizes just like flowers come in all shapes and sizes. So the very most important thing that you want to do is plant a diversity of plants. Uh, that's going to attract a diversity of pollinators. And what you want to do is to create the floral resources throughout the year so that they have nectar and pollen. They have something flowering at all times. That's the most important thing. Uh, so you can pick things that bloom early in the year, like manzanita and ceanothus. You can pick you know, the typical peak spring bloom, like salvias are great, and areognum are really great. Uh, and then things that bloom later in the year, like California fuchsia and, and goldenrod. Uh, so aside from planting a diversity of native plants, you want to plant them in clumps. 
because uh, when you have more resources in one area, that's going to attract the pollinators and, and get them to, to stay there. And so when you attract this diversity of pollinators and you get them to stay there, then they're going to visit your crop plants as well, your food plants. Planting native hedgerows and uh, intercropping with natives um, and other forms of native habitat buffers really uh, enhances the pollination services on a farm. Uh, and attracting these native pollinators um, can mean that you don't have to pay to truck in honeybees, which may or may not survive anyway. So it's been found that, uh, that by putting in these native habitat buffers that the, the producer can recoup their costs in as little as three to four years by enhancing those pollination services. More flowers are going to turn into fruits. You're going to get better shaped fruits, uh, more fully developed uh, fruits. After learning about the many benefits of native plants and pollinators, we wanted to take a closer look at the honeybee and its specific role in pollination. Here we are at our next stop, La Casa de Maria, and we're here to learn about bees. Bees are one of our most important pollinators, and I'm here today to interview Todd Bebb, who's the vice president of the Santa Barbara Beekeepers Association. How's it going, Todd? Good. See, so you're working with the bees. Yeah, going to give them a little smoke to calm them down a little. Excellent. They're out here in this beautiful orchard. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the ecological services they're performing here in this orchard? Well, the, the main ecological service is uh, the pollination of all the plants and the trees and the flowers. So what are the bees looking for when they fly around in this orchard? Well, primarily the pollen and the nectar. Uh, the pollen, of course, is the way that the uh, different plants and flowers um, actually uh, reproduce, right. and which, which creates either a new seed so that the plant can grow up again or it's actually going to produce fruit. Um, all of the stone fruits that we have in the orchard over here rely on the pollinators uh, in order to be able to bear fruit. Right, so without these important pollinators, we aren't having pollination, which is one of the key elements of producing our, all, a lot of our food, right? Mm -hmm. So this orchard is maintained organically, yep. which is great for the bees. Mm -hmm. The bees can thrive in that environment because there aren't any pesticides. Can you tell us a little bit about how pesticides harm bees? Well, it can acutely um, you know, kill them off if the concentrations are high enough. Mm -hmm. But what we're finding more and more is that it's not so much the acute toxicity as it is the long-term effects and specifically the disorientation that they experience. They'll go out to gather pollen or nectar and then they'll have a hard time finding their way back home. Oh, that's so sad. Little disoriented bees cruising around. And some of those pesticides that harm bees are ones that people commonly use in their yards, correct? Yes, I mean, you can go in you know, any, any number of hardware stores and buy any of these pesticides over the counter. And oftentimes without the proper training on knowing, you know, which plants, if something is in bloom, you don't want to spray around that plant. Right, so that's um, incredibly important. There is a time and a place for them, but, you know, we're trying to encourage educated, educated application when it is necessary. Okay, so that's one of the reasons I imagine that you founded the Santa Barbara Beekeepers mm -hmm. Association. What are some of the other services that you prov provide for the community? Well, primarily we're teaching about backyard beekeeping. We're trying to encourage people. We like to say instead of one commercial beekeeper with 10,000 hives, we're striving for 10,000 backyards of you know mm. people like you that are willing to bring a hive into their backyard. The bees are much, much happier. They don't have to travel long distances you know, for the different pollination contracts and such. And it's just a much healthier way. It's natively how the bees have been able to be around for millions of years. Great. So if Santa Barbara or in the whole country can become this network of backyard beekeeping. That's what we're hoping. We'll have the pollination services we need without the commercial beekeeping that's part of the problem that's harming the bees. Exactly. Great. Um, I also heard that if you have a bee swarm in your backyard, you can actually call the Santa Barbara Beekeepers Association. Mm -hmm. And how is that handled? What should people do? Well, we have a uh, what we call a hotline number um, that is 699-6229. And you can call and our dispatch, Henri, will actually put you in contact with one of, and we have about eight to 10 uh, bee rescue techs now. And we'll typically respond within about an hour or try to, and either come capture your swarm or discuss with you options of bringing the bees from inside your wall you know, into a hive like this. And then those bees that we rescue go into a new beekeeper's backyard. 
Nice. So if you want to help the bees, first thing, steer away from using any pesticides in your yard. That's incredibly important. Maintain organically. And lastly, if you do find a bee swarm in your yard, you want to call the Santa Barbara Beekeepers Association and get some education about how to deal with that. Thanks a lot for taking the time today, Todd. You're, you're welcome, Meg. Great right. to see you again. So, are you ready to add some native plants to your garden? If so, check out any of these locations. And now, I'm excited to introduce a fun new segment. Landscape architect and author Billy Goodnick takes us to the scene of a crime in a new series called Crimes Against Horticulture. The story you're about to see is true. The location of these plants has been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city, Santa Barbara, California. Some call it paradise. Mountains and ocean views, classic architecture and exotic gardens. But drive down any street in any neighborhood and you'll find them there, sometimes in broad daylight. People perpetrating pointlessly pitiful pruning on peaceful plants. My name is Billy Goodnick and I run the Crimes Against Horticulture Division. Actually, there's no such thing, but wouldn't it be cool if there were? My mission is to help my community create beautiful, useful, sustainable landscapes. Plants that don't look like a bunch of UFOs, meatballs, and hockey pucks. It was a Thursday morning, a breeze off the Pacific cooling my office, reminding me why I love this town so much. I was wrapping up a report to the chief when Jane dropped a new case file on my desk. What we have here is a gross violation of Plant Code 352, intent to create a hat rack. It's one of the most frequently committed crimes in horticulture. Aside from the fact that topping or stub cutting a tree is just plain ugly and disrespectful to the plant, it also creates a lot of problems. The open cut invites diseases and organisms that can enter the plant and eventually rot out the wood inside. Uh, it's a slow death, but that's what happens eventually. Even worse, new limbs that re-sprout are often weak and can break off. If there's a car underneath, a child playing, or a part of your house, you might want to have the phone number for your insurance company handy. Topping is also expensive. Once you cut a tree that way, you're pretty much obliged to do that every few years because the new growth comes back and it needs to be restricted again. And the other thing is, if you're ever planning on selling your house, there's not a lot of people who find this attractive. So if you want to retain the resale value of your house, treat your trees well. The rule of thumb is never remove more than 25% of the canopy or foliage of any tree or even large shrub. The way to prevent this sort of crime in the first place is to pick the right plant for the right place. Get the size right. Trees come in all different sizes. You should be able to find one that suits your needs and fits the space that you have allowed. And if you need a little bit of help, go to waterwisesb.org. There's a great list of plants there. If you have a problem tree and it exceeds the space that you can allow for it and it just looks like it's not going to stop, sometimes the best thing to do is just to remove the tree completely and start over. If you need to reduce the size of a tree, hire a certified arborist. They're the best qualified to look out for the long-term health of your tree. Well, case closed. Jane, can you refile this? Thanks. Stay tuned for our next episode where landscape architect and author Billy Goodnick will tackle the scene of another horrifying crime, planting a rapidly growing plant into a very small space. So this year, the county water providers teamed up for a new WaterWise garden contest to promote water conservation. Stay tuned as the judges look around at the different gardens and decide who this year's winner will be. First, the judges saw the Montecito Garden of Arthur Posh, who proves that you can have a beautiful garden without using a lot of water. As far as my garden is concerned, I'm, I like that people enjoy the garden. I have a lot of flowers. There's no part in the end of the year where there's not some flowers here. And uh, uh, when people come in and uh, travel through uh, the garden, uh, when they go home, being happy is uh, what I enjoy most. This is my blue garden over here on this side. I have a blue garden in front. 
I have uh, a garden of, uh, of Central Africa, and uh, uh, so all the specimens in there are from that area. The main garden I have is all from South Africa, and right now it's, I don't know of anybody that's done it or not, but I am going to go ahead and make a garden of aloes, and I've got to go ahead and accent with some other color because I know those aloes aren't going to give me flowers all year round, but uh, they're going to be from uh, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Oman. Occasional hand watering as needed. I just do hand water. Yeah. I got two hoses. Everything gets water by hose because I have a marked difference in demand for the different plants I have. So when one doesn't need water, I don't give it. So I water like uh, once a month during the uh, summertime. For brand new pieces to the garden or new plants, I might water a little bit more often. But during the winter time, there is no watering. I used to have right before our feet grass and that grass took more than that of all the rest of my garden and I went ahead and as of December uh, of a year and a half ago I went ahead and it took out the grass and uh, my water bill went down. Next the judges headed to Carpinteria to check out the drought tolerant succulents in John and Susan Everett's garden. The inspiration for changing our landscape was really the Carpinteria Valley Water District and the classes they've been offering. Um, and I've always liked succulents. I'm very partial to succulents. And so when the rebate was offered, we decided to go for it and redo our front yard. We had a landscape designer, Greenleaf Landscaping. Uh, Grant and I drove out to the nurseries and we chose our plants and then we came back here one morning and <laughs> Grant moved the plants all around the yard until I said, stop, that's it, I like it there. <laughs> it was more of a collaborative effort. I like getting clients involved, especially ones who are really have a niche for gardening and yeah, I kind of followed her lead and then I would you know, add my ideas and, and together it was more collaborative. Our watering system is now by drip and it's five minutes twice a week. Our water bill has gone down, I'd say probably $15 a month. A lot of people are, have a great reaction. They're walking their dogs through the neighborhood and they stop and tell us how much they love our front yard. I'm just proud that we've done this and uh, that we accomplished it and that we came up with the design. We came up with a great design for a little private patio up here to enjoy a coffee and just proud of the fact that we accomplished it. The judges then made their way to Santa Barbara to observe the drought tolerant plants that Christine Nolte used to replace her lawn. The inspiration to change my landscape came from just wanting something that looked nice and had some curb appeal and then I got involved in um, gardening classes and reading books and looking at pictures and just decided to go for it. I took advantage of the Smart Rebate program uh, about a year ago and was rewarded for applying and implementing. We, we took out the lawn, which was the majority of the front yard. Um, there were large junipers that we also took out, a cypress tree, um, there was no irrigation at all. It was all hose irrigation. And um, took all that out, recontoured the property, and then uh, started planting. The water comes down the spout, enters a PVC pipe that goes across the yard and goes into the dry well that's right here under the ground. And then the dry well, of course, has holes so that the water can slowly seep out and water the, the garden. And any overage, if we had a really big storm, would be caught in the swale and would go out to drain into the culvert. I think I'm most proud of the design, the way it turned out for form and function, and um, of course, being water wise, but also attracting the local habitat. Then it was on to Galita to talk to Annette Winter about the changes she made to her front yard to make it more water wise. We took out the grass. There was a lawn here before. 
five years ago and then put in mulch all over it, sheep mulched it, and then we put in the water-wise plants and decided we wanted to go with something that you didn't have to water every day. The inspiration to change the landscape was that really grass is just not friendly in this, in this environment anymore. Also, when we moved up here and I started taking the uh, classes, at City College, I heard about the $1,000 rebate for the landscaping and we applied for that and um, they came out and took photographs and watched the, the garden as it evolved. That was very nice, that was a great incentive actually. Maintaining the garden has been a learning process. Um, it's a lot easier in many respects than worrying about grass and having to deal with weeds and all kinds of strange and wonderful things. Um, we're gradually moving. We've had a, a variety of plants installed, but gradually I'm putting in the stronger ones that require less care and less water that seem to thrive with not a lot of attention. We have a variety of uh, watering systems in the garden. Um, we have the drip system, which works very well for some plants. For the roses, we have the little rose sprinklers that go on underneath each rose. And actually, some of the plants now are off water totally. And some plants, I did start off by watering too much and they developed fungus and died. Our water bill has really um, dropped down considerably. I mean, I was watering a lot with the grass. We had grass front and back. We've put in Diamondier out back now instead of the grass. The neighbors have loved it. We had people for the first, actually the first year come by and they still come by and tell us how nice it is. For the future, I am, I'm looking to put in more natives, even more water friendly plants and uh, things that attract bees. We've got a lot of, lots of bees in the garden and everything else that you know is, is good for the garden. If I were going to recommend how to go about this, I would say do a lot of research beforehand. People have visions of what they want in a garden and sometimes the vision doesn't quite match with what will work. And sometimes what will work is, it turns out to be so much nicer than what you had in mind. And that's where I think a professional designer helps too. Somebody who really knows how plants will do and uh, you know, can give you some advice. The judges then made their way to Lompoc to admire the garden of Harvey and Jeanette Wynne and ended their journey in Santa Maria at the stunning garden of Ken and Shandy Mann. Well, the votes are in, and the winner of this year's Waterwise Garden Contest is... Christine Nolte of Santa Barbara. Congratulations, Christine, and to all the runner-ups. There were a lot of great contestants this year, so start preparing your garden, because next year's winner could be you. Now, you may be wondering, what tree can I plant in my backyard that provides habitat and is well adapted for our arid climate? Leif Skogberg from the Ojai Foundation has an idea in What Tree Is That? What tree is that? What tree is that? Ah, what tree is that? What tree is that? Hey, I'm here at the Ojai Foundation with Leif Skogberg, and today we're going to talk about his favorite tree, the oak tree. Now there's two types we're going to focus on. One is the valley oak, Quercus labata. The other one is the coast live oak, Quercus agrifolia. Thanks for having us today, Leif. Mm, my pleasure. Thanks for coming on up. All right. And we're lucky enough to be sitting under this gorgeous coast live oak tree. Can you tell us a little bit about this particular tree? This oak tree is reported to be about 600, 700 years old. Wow. And um, I've been told that it was a ceremonial land, that the Shumash would come up the, the Ahai village or tribe lived in the, in the upper Ojai Valley here, and this was a place where they would come up to do ceremony. The other thing that's amazing about oak trees is their adaptability. So, you know, we're up here in this dry ridge in the Ojai Valley, which is a seasonal desert, basically, and um, pretty much a desert climate. And the live oak does pretty well here, but mostly just on the north slopes. Mm -hmm. And you see, so you can look up on the mountainside over here and you're looking at a south slope and you don't see any oak trees because it's too hot and too dry. But if you look the other direction, the other mountains on the other side of the valley are covered in oak woodland. Mm -hmm. And that's because they're, they grow in this niche of, of the, um, the cooler, kind of wetter, moister slopes. But, but oak trees also grow in a huge range of habitats all over the world from uh, subtropical rainforest to desert conditions similar to this. 
So one thing you got to look out for, of course, is fire in oak trees, that this is a very flammable plant, correct? Well, that's a good question. The, um, the oak trees are really, they've evolved in a fire ecology. So they really need the fire on a regular basis in order to cycle the nutrients and to do interior pruning. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times if there's not fire happening in a landscape, oak trees need to be pruned on the inside to keep the, the branches from getting too clogged up and dense. Yeah. And it also is really important for the mineral cycle around the oak trees so that the nutrients can be broken back down and available back to the tree. But if you're planting an oak tree in your yard, I'm guessing you're not going to be probably burning underneath it. So pruning is the option. What are some other things you can do if you have an oak tree in your yard to make sure that it stays healthy? So there's several factors to consider when wanting to maintain the health of an oak tree or several oak trees in a landscape. You can do lots of mulching to, to protect the roots and to keep a good um, organic layer, keep the, moist, the soil moist. And um, we also, on occasions, um, give offerings of milk and other things that are high in calcium. So if you want to plant an oak tree in your yard, what kind of area or little microclimate are you looking for that an oak would thrive in? Mm. It's a great question. Well, oaks need a lot of space. As you can see, that they, they get very big. And so if we're going to be doing sustainable landscaping, we want the right plant for the right space. So mm -hmm. they need a big space, first of all. And you, you don't want to have things underneath of the oak tree that are going to need water or to have the oak tree near things that are getting regular water. So if um, oak trees are sprouting up in your fruit orchard or your vegetable garden, probably not the best place for oak trees. But in a native habitat where it's gonna, the soil is going to stay dry um, in the dry season um, is a great place for native oak trees. So there are a few important pests and diseases you should know about that might plague your oak trees. One is the oak tree moth. And if you want to learn more about that, I did an interview with Sarah Kitson in GardenWise episode two, where she talks all about how to treat your trees organically for the oak moth. So go ahead and check that out. Another common problem with oak trees is root rot fungus. And this can be a really bad one. And it's actually killed a lot of oak trees all over California. Is that a problem you have with the oak trees here, Leaf? We haven't had any problems with it, but it often happens in areas where oaks are getting water around their base or where mulch is building up along around the trunk. So, um, so we always want to mulch oak trees and, and let the mulch build up, but we don't want the mulch to build up around the trunk of the tree. And we, don't, we want to try not to let any irrigation or water get into the root zone of the tree because that can promote the root rot fungus. How do you know when you have the root rot fungus in your tree? Uh, well, you'll get what's known as sudden oak death, mm -hmm. and um, you'll see oaks just dying. And it also can come from diseased wood, mm -hmm. so you have to be careful about what uh, diseased wood you're introducing to your site. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between the valley oak and the coast live oak, because those are the two we really want to show people in this episode, because those are the most common ones in mm -hmm. Santa Barbara County. Yep. And you mostly would see the coast live oak, obviously, right near the coast or on the mountains, kind of just coming up adjacent to the coast, mm -hmm. and then the valley oak would be down in the valleys further away. One of the biggest differences is, um, that's obvious to most people, I think, is that the coast live oak is evergreen, that's right. and the valley oak is deciduous, mm -hmm. and the valley oak has a leaf that looks like what people think of as an oak leaf, right. that it's lobed, and it's a larger leaf that's leathery, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people are confused by the leaf of the coast live oak, because that's not what we think of when we think of an oak leaf. So both the coast live oak and the valley oak are extremely long-lived trees. They're really well adapted to the climate in Santa Barbara County. And it's a great tree to use in your yard if you've got some space and you want to invite lots of wildlife and birds into your yard. Have you been looking for a great tree to provide shade in your backyard? Well, the oak tree might be a perfect fit, but remember, give it lots of room to spread and don't overwater it. Well, that does it for this episode. Remember, you are the agent of change, and together we can conserve water and create beautiful gardens with habitat for birds, bees, and butterflies. There's lots of resources online that can help. Visit waterwisesb.org for information or to view past episodes. You can also visit our Facebook page. I'm your host, Meg West, and keep it green, Santa Barbara.